Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. My name is John Rose. I'm the Richfield American Legion Commander. I welcome you today to the memorial service for our brother Tom McCarthy. Events today will have a prayer by our Chaplain Wirtz, a few words by Past Commander Brian Laco, followed by the flag presentation, national anthem, a rifle salute, and taps. Thank you again for attending the ceremony. Heavenly Father, we are gathered here today to honor a fallen comrade in arms and to see him off to his next assignment in post everlasting. Father, thank you for the opportunity to know and to serve with Thomas McCarthy. We've been blessed by his strength, honesty, and friendship. We endorse to you our personal witness of his commitment to you and our country. His innermost being knew, and he willingly gave the sacrifice of self, which is required in this most noble service. Standing shoulder to shoulder in the ranks or stepping out to lead, he stood tall and gave it his best. He did not suffer those who badmouthed this country or the principles upon which it was built. He remained prepared and active in the defense of those principles and the bright future they have allowed him to pass on to the next generation. Thank you, Father, for Thomas McCarthy. His assignment here is complete. We commit his spirit to you with a final salute and a hearty well done from his comrades. We will miss him. In Jesus' name, amen. Recover. Commander Tom McCarthy, age 20, left his home in Santa Cruz, California, and from 1964 to 1968, served his country in the United States Navy. During the last years, he was off the coast of Vietnam on the guided missile light cruiser USS Providence CLG-6. The Providence engaged the enemy by bombardment with her six-inch guns and missiles. During the Tet Offensive in 1968, she fired upon Hue and breached the wall, allowing for decisive action by the United States Marine Corps. SH-3 McCarthy was awarded the Vietnam Service Medal with two Bronze Stars, the Vietnam Campaign Medal, Navy Unit Commendation Medal, and the National Defense Medal. Fifty years ago, after serving with valor, ship's serviceman 3 McCarthy came home to Southern California. For the next 50 years, Tom continued to serve. The last 25 years, he and Sherry have given back and served in so many ways. For the last 10 years, 
through his membership in our American Legion, Tom has given back to Ridgefield with his patriotism, his love of country, his love of our flag. A Marine once answered a question about what he feared. His answer was that he feared letting down the legacy of those who have gone before. The legacy of valor. Tom still serves in remembering the legacy. We love Tom and Sherry. We honor them and we grieve with Sherry. Tom will be remembered. His ID tag will be attached to one of our street flags forever. The legacy of valor goes on remembering Tom and his service. Our Sons of American Legion Commander P.J. Hawk South will do our national anthem. And salute. Baker, out there. Who? Praise it. Who? Please feel free to join along. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the to have the Patriot Guard and American Legion Riders here. They will now present the flag.
On behalf of the President of the United States and a grateful nation, please accept this flag given in recognition of Tom's dedicated service to country. Within the folds of this flag, we'll place the brass of the prayers that were sent aloft in a volley of three in honor of our hero Tom McCarthy's service. On behalf of Sea Service and the American Legion, I present this. We wrote your name in the sky, but the wind blew it away. We wrote your name in the sand, but the waves washed it away. We wrote your name in our hearts, and forever it will stay. We honor a life that was lived to the full. We honor a spirit now free. You'll long be remembered whenever we say, fair winds and following sea. On behalf of all the Patriots assembled here today, please accept this small token as our appreciation of our hero's service and his faithful devotion. Honor Guard, dismissed. That completes our ceremony here. Uh, there will be a celebration of life at the community center two blocks north. You're certainly all welcome to attend. Thank you so much for this really nice attendance today. It means so much to all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
the flies of any particular situation may escape us because the Bible says that God's ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. As high as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are his ways higher than our ways and his thoughts higher than our thoughts. And they are often beyond our understanding. But while we may mourn the moment, those with faith in Christ are promised a better day, a day of resurrection, the great hope of the Christian faith, a day when, according to God's holy, holy word, this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. And when the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? <coughs> Thinking of Tom's experience with sailing, or Captain Tom, as he was known to many at the time. Thinking of this man and the trials of these past weeks brought to mind a poem written by Alfred Lord Tennyson, which is entitled Crossing the Bar. The poem itself is a metaphor for death, the first stanza of which is, Sunset and evening star, and one clear call for me. And may there, may there be no moaning of the bar, and I put out to sea. The concept of crossing the bar may need an explanation for some. As the water for the land empties into the sea, an underwater wall of sediment can form where there is no to meet the tidal forces. And this can form a natural shoal or a sandbar, which is both a blessing and a curse. In many parts of the world, the bar makes a natural harbor, protecting those closer to land from the powerful forces of the sea. And this is surely a blessing. But these same bars are often a formidable and an ever-changing barrier to cross. Crossing the bar refers to that time when passing over the treacherous shifting shoals in order to make it out to the open sea. It is always a dangerous time, and in some cases, it's really only possible for the <coughs> sailors to guide their boats across in high tides, or maybe with the aid of a giant wave. They rely on these to bring them to safety. Crossing the bar can be such a hazardous endeavor that in some places, local harbor pilots who know the harbor intimately come aboard and actually take the ships in and out. Now these harbor pilots are well aware that there's often a point of no return, a point where the pilot is committed to cross, and it will either pass safely over or meet with disaster. Once the ship has begun the crossing, there's no turning back. Tennyson ended his poem by writing this, Twilight and evening bell, and after that the dark, and may there be no sadness of farewell when I embark. For though from out our bourne of time and place the flood may bear me far, I hope to see my pilot face to face when I have crossed the bar. In the spiritual realm, crossing the bar refers to getting the last stretch of our life here on the earth. It's the time before we put out into that great sea forever, leaving our physical life behind and going forward to the next. Tennyson wrote that he longed to see his pilot face to face, the one who will guide him safely across the bar, separating this life from the next. Later in his life, he explained that the pilot has been aboard, has been on board all the while, but in the dark, I have not seen him. He is that divine, unseen, who is always guiding us. This life, and our understanding of it, is like a harbor. It is a place that we know. For many, as one day blends into the next, it is a place of safety. We gauge our tomorrows by our past, and what has been will always be. What we forget, however, is that each and every day is a gift from God. Every breath that we take is the only one that we can claim truly is our own. What we forget is while the harbor is a place we cling to, each and every one of us will one day pass over that bar, out of the harbor we know, and into that great sea of eternity. In this poem, Tennyson wrote about crossing the bar, and he was absolutely right. If Jesus tarries, we will all cross the bar someday. The 
Bible reminds us that it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. And this is one appointment we must all keep, a time of reckoning that awaits us all. We cannot escape this reality. And if crossing the bar is death, who better to serve as our harbor pilot than Jesus Christ, the Savior of mankind who has made the crossing before us and stands ready to take us from the familiar harbor of the life we know into the great sea of eternity. Now we need to remember, we need to remind ourselves that death is part of our Father's plan to bring us all back to Him. This life is not the ocean of forever, but it's just a harbor. It's a place where we wait and prepare for that greatest in all adventures that lie ahead for each of us. That time when the eternal part of us, that which was made in the image of our Father, crosses the bar and turns again home. Thomas made this journey. And because we loved him, because we miss him, we mourn. But as we grieve, let us also rejoice. Rejoice for being able to know him. Rejoice in the memories of the time spent together. Rejoice in the richness that he brought to our lives. And let us also rejoice that for Tom, the time of trials and tribulations of this life are over, and that he is safely home in the arms of God. Let's pray. Our Father in God, here in the presence of the shadow of death, we know that you are the source of all life. And although your gift of sweet breath of life is now ours to embrace, may we live each day in the awareness that we too shall one day walk through the valley of death's shadow. Help us to see death as you see it, not the end, but the beginning. Not a wall, but a doorway. Not a dark road, but a path that leads to eternal life and life. Lord, we know that this physical life is a journey that begins, that unfolds, and it ends. And when, in your wisdom and in the time you choose, it is our time to come home. May Jesus Christ be our pilot that leads us safely across the bar and into your loving embrace. We ask that you comfort Tom's family members and friends here today. May they turn to your word for consolation and peace. And may they seek the purpose in their heart to seek you while you may be found. In the name of Christ our Savior we pray. Amen. Now today we celebrate the life of Tom McCarthy, a man who has enriched the lives of all who knew him by his very presence. Is there anyone here who would like to share a memory of Tom with us now? I know many of you that interact with Tom and uh, uh, I first got to know Tom and Sherry when Bruce and I would have uh, some gathering potlucks at our house and so that was my first introduction and the, uh, one of the most meaningful parts of our friendship is, is after Pat, Bruce passed away, um, I had, there's, they're not here today, but anyway, Rich and Jan took me under their wing, and then Tom and Sherry uh, always welcomed me. I could stop by there anytime, say hi, Tom would come out, we'd talk about any number of things from how to coil a rope, uh, what well, line, <laughs> sailors talk, to, uh, um, you know, working with concrete, uh, made a neat little plaque for my dog as it passed away, but uh, they would invite me over for dinner, and they would be part of their family. So there's uh, what uh, you know, living here by myself without family nearby. It's just so meaningful to me to uh, have Tom and Sherry uh, part of my life. I'm looking forward to spending more time with Sherry. Right. Thank you, Sherry. You might be able to recognize some of these uh, faces, but that Bruce Crockett in the background, <laughs> and Tom, and myself, and Leo, <clears throat> and this is memorable to me. Uh, this is the day that we put the flagpole up in the Ridgefield Cemetery, a project taken months to plan all concrete work, little engineering, and 
this point in time, we have glorious day, the spring, and the flagpole goes up. Concrete base. And this is about 40 bags of concrete. <laughs> and this 30 foot pole ends up almost four feet into the hole. It has an internal uh, lanyard, which means that the rope is inside the pole, it doesn't go up and down outside. So we have gotten the pole up and we held it still and we put in numerous bags of sand in the cylinder hole in the concrete to pack around the pole and it is secure. <laughs> it's been tapped down and that pole is secure. And you can see there's four of us there sort of observing these different ropes here and there. And I like to think of the guys on the right as being the most intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> and in any event, at this moment in time, someone took this picture and somehow preserved it. <clears throat> but all of us, Leo on the left, he sort of looks just stunned when he realizes what we're looking at. Tom here is just sort of quietly looking. <laughs> As we have discovered that the rope inside the pole, down four feet, somehow got underneath the pole. <laughs>
continued memories that we have with Sherry, we totally look forward to. Love you, We were uh, two guys that were always there, and Tom would always come over to the house and say, come on, you come in with me. And uh, next thing you know, we're on the back of an auger or pulling a, a line or a rope, doing something that Commander Laco would want us to do. So, um, and never complain. There he is right there, laughing at me on the ground, pulling that wrench out. So, that was one of the days Tom and I were together. We spent a lot of time together. Uh, I loved being with him and Sherry. They, we'd go over the house for potluck dinners and uh, camp outs and that sort of thing on our our street, North Cardi Road. So we really enjoyed it. And Tom and Sherry were two, and Parker, that made it really special for us to be at. And, uh, we moved away, or I moved away to Hawaii, and uh, but I'll never forget North, you know, North Cardi Road in Ridgefield. Thank you. I'm J.R. Campbell, I'm the brother-in-law of Tom and Jerry, and one of my earliest uh, memories is when Linda and I had went out uh, to Hawaii uh, to visit, and uh, first time meeting Tom living at the slip in Honolulu Bay, Barber Bay, and uh, one of the first things Tom did, I could tell he's very adventurous, was to, he has a little dinghy that was tied up to the back of the boat, a little rubber raft, and he says, come on, let's go, and I jump in, and we go out of the harbor, and uh, about that time, you see a well come up, spritzed out the water and stuff. It was just amazing. And then they took us out on a night uh, sailing as well. But uh, that was one of my first first adventure things with Tom that I, I got to know. Um, I just want to tell you from the, our family, thank you for all your friendship, everything you've done. Thank you. We've been uh, me uh, members of the American Legion up at Cape Horn, or, I don't know, since 2001 or something like that. Anyway, we moved down here, and um, that was in 2010, I think, or something like that, or nine, I guess. Anyway, we came in uh, as new members to the post here, and and the first persons that talked to us was Tom, and and I and he and I really we really bonded because we were both beekeepers. And so we were just talking bees all over the place, and honey, and, and I, mean, I had trouble with bears getting into my hive. And, and also, I'm a master gardener and involved with the Vancouver Farmer's Market, where Tom would sell his products there. So not only a dish that we know him through the Legion, but also through the gardening, the Farmer's Market, and, and beekeeping, and he's always been, like I say, he was the first person to really welcome us to this post, and and you know we just we just love them both, and and he's always been so Tom. <laughs> I don't know how to say it, you know, but just very special, and, and we just really really enjoy knowing him. Uh, mentioned the last Fourth of July. We went to a party with Tom and his wife up in the hills, 20 miles east of here and a little north. And we took all kinds of roads. We were in a caravan of cars that went up to this home. And finally, when we decided we were, we were going to head back down and come home, and we're, we're coming down alone. And we've been on a dozen different roads up there, winding through those hills. And, through the woods. <coughs> we, he and his wife and I are all saying, well, should we turn right or left at the next corner? Because we've been on so many different roads. So we would decide, well, we're going to go to the right in this, this corner. 
and uh, go a little farther, and he said, no, let's, the next one, let's take the road to the left. And uh, so he guided us on down, although he didn't know the roads either. He'd never been on that road himself. <laughs> it ended up, we came out east of uh, uh, the, the town east of here, uh, Down and we came out east of there, and he had his car just been painted, and it was all fixed up. We'd had to pray here in town, and then we'd gone to this home. And he kept saying, guys were throwing firecrackers at us along the road sometimes. He said, I don't want one of them on my car to spoil my paint job. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, we got down without a problem. We didn't uh, take any more time getting down and got getting up there, but I don't know how we got down. <laughs> and he dropped me off at my home, he and his wife. Uh, that was my first introduction to, to meeting him, and that was uh, just last summer. He turned out he's quite a guy. So I got to know Sherry and I met Tom. And we spent many a uh, St. Patrick's Day over at their house. That man could cook. He made the best corned beef and cabbage you would ever taste. He just awesome. And he, my granddaughters, when they were little, because they couldn't fit on his lap now, he used to take them around the yard and on the tractor. And so we have some really fun memories. Um, uh, we're Rick and Jackie, and we've known Tom for a few years through the Ridgefield Market. We sat, we were side by side. <laughs> we have the understanding back of never showing up when it rained. <laughs> <laughs> and never would be under our tent, just soaking wet. And he was always there the next week, and I said, God, well, he made a mistake once Saturday. And it started raining about, oh, two hours into the market. <laughs> and next thing I know, his stuff is in our tent. We <laughs> 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 love that man. He always has this incredible hat. Like he was either wearing that hat or he was wearing one of these hats. <laughs> Every time I see a picture up there with his hat, it makes me want to smile. I'm Darren, and this is my wife, Juanita, and we've known mostly through American Legion. Um, but all of this talk of food and stuff, Tom did have his own way of doing stuff, and he was adventuresome. And he and Sherry invited us over for dinner one night with Alan. With Alan and <laughs> So we thought, well, we'd just bring a bottle of wine and, you know, do the, do the normal thing. But we got there at like 5.30 or so and sat down and had a nice conversation and they started cooking and, and so, well, then it took a little longer than we planned. I think this was a new recipe that Tom was working on. Because he hadn't quite figured out everything yet. <laughs> so we finished the first bottle of wine. And then they brought out another bottle of wine, and I think we finally ate at about midnight, but we wouldn't have eaten anything by that time. It <laughs> was such a great evening, we tried to figure out how to do that again, but we never got to do that. I met Tom and Sherry, well, Tom first, down in Vancouver Farmers Market, it was on like 6th Street. And um, we hit it off, and then hit it off with Sherry and everything, my husband was in, he's retired Navy, senior chief Navy now. But um, I always remember Tom in that hat, flannel shirt, and comfortable pants and stuff. And we were always talking about, like, he was always thinking. And so when he decided to move his business from Battleground there on, in Duluth to his house, He's like, he, I remember him saying, you know, well, I want it this way and I want it that way. And I talked to these garden designers and everything, and they want like 200 bucks an hour. And I go, well, I could design that for you if you want to work together on it. And I remember us all sitting 
down. And it took, you know, a few weeks and stuff. And it was so much fun, though, because Sherry had already